Welcome to the Bronx Latino History Project. My name is Stephen Payne, librarian and archivist at the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is July 22nd, 2021, and we have the immense pleasure of being here with Aviva Argote, an educator, nonprofit consultant, facilitator, mother, and much more. She also happens to be the daughter of Danny Argote, who grew up in the Bronx, was a young lord and a mental health care worker at Lincoln Hospital, where he met his wife, Marcia Kroll. Among other things, Danny was also a founding faculty member at Bo Boricua College, but Aviva herself will tell us more about both of her parents. So why don't we start with your father's family history as far back as you know, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so my uh, maternal, or my paternal, let's see, my father's grandmother, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Maria Gomez, uh, who I knew as Aya, uh, was born and raised in Puerto Rico. And my father's father's mother um, was uh, born and raised in Havana, Cuba. Mm. And so my grandfather, came from Cuba, my grandmother, um, so my grandfather, um, Mario Argote, and my grandmother, Asuncion Gomez, uh, ended up coming from Puerto Rico and Cuba, respectively. Um, they, my grandmother came after my great-grandmother, whose brother had established himself in an apartment in East Harlem in El Barrio, sure. and so my grandmother came there, and when she met my grandfather, they began their life together um, in uh, East Harlem. And my father actually was born in Harlem Hospital. Mm -hmm. And my older uncle Mario was born uh, at Montefiore and then my aunt uh, Milagros was born somewhere in there. Um, let me know if you have questions too. I'm just gonna kind of go and tell you what I know, but. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, um, so did you ever learn much about why um, I, why the respective members of your family left Cuba and um, Puerto Rico, or do you know much about that history? I know a little bit more about the Puerto Rican side. Um, Aya, who who got her name from my uncle Mario, who couldn't say abuela, and when she went back and forth between Puerto Rico and New York, he would always say, quiero estar allá, allá, allá. <laughs> he just named her Aya, and then all of us since then. Uh, yeah. and, and that's the name that my daughter carries now. Her name is Aya. Oh, sure. Um, so uh, uh, Aya um, uh, married Rafael uh, Gomez, um, who was a Spanish soldier. And uh, as far as I understand, it wasn't a very good relationship. And so she ended up um, in many ways serving as kind of the maid um, to their family. Um, and came to New York to try and uh, establish a different life. Sure. And she left my grandmother with her aunts, with uh, Aya's sisters, um, Tere and Josefina. And so my grandmother grew up in part in Puerto Rico with her aunts mm. and then came over when I think she was around maybe 17, 18 or something like that uh, be with her mother. Um, and I know less about why my abuelo Mario came over. Sure, um, sure. But I have ideas that, you know, what I know about that is that he ended up spending some time in Little Italy and became a very good cook. And one of our family, you know, we have arroz con gandules, but we also have these like Italian meals that came from Abuelo Mario. <laughs> it, it's, it's so funny because um, you're, I think, the second person in maybe two weeks uh, to mention um, kind of the adoption of Italian cooking uh, um, and uh, there's another person I interviewed who, I don't remember if, maybe it's, yeah, her mother um, uh, became, you know, an expert Italian cook. Her mother was P Puerto Rican and, and you know, they would eat Italian food pretty much just as, as often as, as Puerto Rican food. So anyway, things are very New York <laughs> thing. That's so, because our whole family, the calamare, like it's, it like runs through. That is so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so did you ever hear much about uh, uh, about the circumstances of your father's family moving up to the Bronx? A little. Um, I guess I should say just on the on my grandfather's side. Um, so my grandfather was a twin, Mario and Enrique, mm -hmm. and um, their mother, who I believe her first name was Isabella, but I can confirm that. 
Uh, her last name was Argote. Mm. She also had those children with, I believe, a Spanish soldier. Oh, uh, I, see, I see. She was African Cuban. She was, I, I know, I, the stories I hear of her, I never met her, are that she was black. Um, okay, sure. And Enrique and Mario came over together. Um, and Enrique, you know, my, yeah, his son ended up in Queens um, and sort of uh, had a, a slightly different path. But what I know is that um, my grandparents met hanging out with some friends and mutual friends in El Barrio and ended up moving up. Their first place in the Bronx was on Tintin Avenue. Sure. And at this stage, they had my uncle, my, my aunt, Milagros and my father, who probably was a baby. I mean, he was definitely a little baby. Yeah. Um, and then they moved to Jackson Avenue. Um, mm. And that's, Jackson Avenue is the place that I've heard the most about, right? Yeah. So they, uh, and that is where um, my Aunt Lydia and my Uncle Sammy and my Uncle Johnny were born. Um, and so most of the stories that I hear about take place in about the 10 years that they lived in Jackson Avenue. Sure. Uh, and what I know about that, I mean, you know, the stories that I hear always have to do with making box carts and making kites, getting flour and making glue, like adding water and making glue and going up to the top of the buildings to fly the kites. Yeah. Um, and stick ball, stick ball, stick ball, stick, stick ball, stick ball. Stick ball. ball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know what else they did, but as far as I'm concerned, they flew kites and played stick ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I heard I heard one story about flying kites. I want to be surprised if this happened on Jackson Avenue, um, but uh, some particularly ambitious kite flyers uh, apparently would, um, uh, I guess, tie razor blades or things to kites to try to get other kites, knock other kites down. So. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, my dad talked about that. So they'd make the glue. And then they were fine razor blades, right? So that you could cut somebody else's kite string while it wasn't, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll call it strategic kite flying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so what, what are some of the stories that you heard the most about Jackson Avenue, aside from like the kind of games and uh, play that they would, they would do? I mean, the play was pretty significant, right? Sure. So the the images that I have, right, are of the milkman coming and my father and my uncle racing to get to the milk bottles to see who could get the first milk because it had the cream on top, right? Like, uh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, food was precious and, and valued. Um, and then they liked the tops of the bottles for something. I forget what kind of game they would play. And that they were out, like they went out onto the street and they were gone. Like, I don't hear that much about school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hear is about walking to and from school. Like, that's where the action was. Yeah. But the, the like, they would just be out playing um, on the street all the time until my grandmother would yell down and say, come on up for dinner. Yeah. Um, and to me, some of the stories I hear are like, uh, of, so that's a pretty wide range. Um, sure. Six six aunts and uncles of mine. Um, and so Uncle Mario was the first to leave and ended up going into the Navy during the Korean War. And then my aunt Milagros got married when she was 18. And so my father was kind of the eldest in the home um, sure. with the three younger siblings, right? And so um, the, I hear about um, the gangs, Right, so yeah. the, the way that the stories that I hear of gangs are groups of boys that play together and fought occasionally, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. That's the, uh, eventually, and I don't know that this was on Jackson Avenue, I think it was later, and this was actually probably in El Barrio, my father was part of the Gay Robins. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but it's sort of like up in the Bronx is where that started, right? That's, that's how they hung. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. For sure. So many different, so many different neighborhood gangs. Uh, um, I mean, there's a few of the more notorious ones, but most of them, most of them, I think it was like, you know, a block or even half a block as far as their, uh, their span. <laughs> yeah, the turf, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The things that I he heard about school um, from everybody, this is like all my aunts and uncles consistently, is we were told we were nobody. Yeah. We were told that um, we couldn't learn. Uh, 
they knew we were Puerto Rican, but my, so if you were to line my family up by skin color, yeah. my father would have been on the darkest end, uh, okay, by far, sure. darkest of everybody. Um, my, my, my great grandmother, Aya was, uh, we believe she's a native Taino. Um, she, oh, sure. you know, people say that's where I got my hair yeah. and he also was dark. So, so we had sort of Aya and my father is the darkest. Um, and so my father was also kind of treated like he was black. Right, yeah. Uncle Mario as well. He was kind of next in line. Um, Sammy and Lydia were a little lighter, and then my my uncle Johnny, who passed away a while ago, was the lightest. Right, so a little bit of their experience had to do with their spectrum on the color scale. Absolutely. Um, so what I heard was, you can't learn math because you're not smart enough. Uh, my father, in particular, had a math teacher who knocked math full out of him. And my father always said he loved, he was really interested in math. And my whole growing up, you know, when we were in school and learning math, it was this, um, this, this real scar that was sadness, but he was just so delighted when we would engage in anything math related. And my mother, yeah. like a math whiz, and my grandfather on her side actually taught math. Like, so wow. it's sort of this, this thread of you're, you're stupid, you can't do that, right? Yeah. Um, and my father was always really hands-on and handy, always. Sure. And I didn't learn until later in life that he was tracked into the machine and metal trades high school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So many black and Puerto Rican children were, um, I mean, still still are in a lot of yep. places for sure, yeah. And I just learned, I didn't know this until I talked to Uncle Mario uh, two weeks ago, that when my father went there, it was the school itself was on a ship that was docked uh off the fdr oh wow wow <laughs> so, like like a, I, you know i was like oh, like a ship he's like yeah but like the intrepid you know like a yeah. huge warship wow <laughs> <laughs> wow that's wild <laughs> isn't that wild I yeah thought, wow well, it's just amazing um and so that's that's the like the energy and the vibe um and then, then you know there's little family stories of um my grandmother my great grandmother uh was was the matriarch and somehow wherever aya was everything was okay right and so whatever the hardships were that happened out on the street they kind of arrived home home ground to her and apparently she used to send each one of them out they each thought they didn't know this until long after she passed away that she was their special one and she used to say you know <laughs> she'd give them a nickel and and said mijo mijo and then ask each child separately to go get her a cigarette <laughs> 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 on the little candy store the bodega so they come back uh she grew up in a cigar factory in puerto rico uh, and so she smoked cigars and cigarettes that's part yeah. of that was part of her come from yeah sure sure yeah i think i think the cigar factories in Puerto Rico were some of the first um, industries that had huge like unionization campaigns. Like I think in the 1910s and 1920s even. Um, yes. Yeah. So it's interesting because the little fuzzy memories I have, my grandfather, my Cuban grandfather also worked in the cigar factory. Right? Oh, oh, sure. His, his, the experience that I have heard about his is that they would all get together and hire somebody who knew how to read. And that person would sit in the middle of the factory reading novels, yeah. right? Like, like famous Russian literature, right? And so it was like a whole experience. In Puerto Rico, that's not the story that I heard. Mm, sure, sure. Right? It was like a different, but it's just so interesting because they, they share that, that come from. Yeah, yeah. What do you do? You know what? Um, uh, either of your grandparents on your father's side, um, uh, the different jobs that they had in New York City. Um, yeah. So yeah. my my grandfather. Um, uh, so the, um, they were in Jackson Avenue, and then I'll. Um, my grandfather worked at the school. The um, that both. But that Lydia and my uncle Sammy and and me and um, Johnny went to. Um, I can get the I forget which one it was, but he was. Um, oh, I always knew him as the custodian, mm. right? 
Um, but our uh, abuelo, uh, it was like on 152nd Street, I think. Um, okay, okay. He was, his title was engineer. Mm. And so what he did for, for like most of his life as a father with the kids who were young, um, they talk about him going and shoveling the coal. Like the school was always warm. He cleaned the bathrooms. Yeah. He always brought home the extra milk and the food, right? So that's sort of like part of how, um, and so he like tended to the school. So I janitor see. isn't quite the right word because it no, sounds, no. Um, and he needed to have like, a, there was something uh, in order to work the furnace, there was some level of, it actually was like fireman status of some kind. Okay, yeah, yeah. Which is super interesting. Um, is. Well, here's then, the where they were living in Jackson Avenue, they got kicked out because the St. Mary's projects were going to be built. Oh, I see. Okay, so so they were they were part of the many people displaced by uh, uh, well slum slum clearance, I guess, as they they called it. And they, yeah, yeah. So they moved with the promise that they could move back into St. Mary's once it was built, and yeah. there and. But they like when 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 my aunt Lydia and Uncle Mary talk about this 1825 Bruckner Boulevard, right? Mm -hmm. And you had to have like a certain you had to be below a certain income. Yeah. And um and at that point, then my grandfather had moved just above the income, so then they moved to 152nd Street on Westchester Avenue. Oh, and okay, sure. They were there for two years, and they talk about that as rat and roach infested, dirty hard right like it was hard and at this point my uncle mario and my aunt milagros who we call Wee, were gone so it was the four kids and it just sounded bad like that that was they didn't feel poor like all i'm saying we didn't know we were poor growing up that place oh. had them feeling poor i see yeah 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 and so because abuelo mario's income was just above my grandmother didn't work um oh, and eventually they did get back into saint mary's okay okay yeah yeah um, and it was new and um, yeah, which was, which was great. Um, and so that's, that's what I know of my grandfather's work. And then by that time, my father started working in a factory. Okay. And was he still in high school when he started working in a factory? I believe so. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing so. Um, yeah. But at least later high school. Um, yeah, sure. So I have heard of it. My Uncle Mario says it was a print shop, but what? What, like my father had this unbelievable skill that whenever like we were at camp he would send packages he packed things like nobody else like, <laughs> he was so good like he knew how to wrap a box efficiently effective easy to open but nothing came out and i would be like poppy what <laughs> he's like, oh it's the factory so i believe that this factory it, uncle mario described it as a jewish print shop okay. it was not I think it was on Vassar Street, like down, down, uh, Varick Street. Um, okay. He had taken me down to Varick Street once. We were doing something. He's like, oh, this is where I used to go. So it was like way down. Yeah. My understanding is that he was the, the one packing and opening boxes. Ah, uh, I see, I see. So yeah. I remember him talking about having the blade, but he's just, he was like a whiz with boxes because he spent a long time there. <laughs> and the story that I know most from then, so at that point, um, he was probably getting ready to finish high school and maybe finished high school because yeah. I believe it was when he was 19. Um, he had disregarded the draft notes that he had gotten. Oh, sure, yeah. And then um, the FBI came to the factory on Barrack Street and uh, took him. Oh, wow. They basically, you know, he, he, he described it as being kidnapped. Um, yeah. And he arrived at the, uh, whatever it is, you know, the military station. And <laughs> I've heard the story from him and my aunt and my uncle. Um, he like stood up on a chair and he said, anybody here from the Bronx? And a few people, he's like, anybody from Jackson Avenue? And there's a few people. So he went to them. <laughs> he said, Does anybody have a dime? I got to call my mom. Like, I don't even, I just got kidnapped. Here. I don't have any clothes. I don't yeah. have anything. Um, and so he got a dime or a nickel, whatever it was, and he, he called, you know, Abuela, and off he went for two years, not returning home to military service. Wow, that's crazy. Did, do you know if, he, if his avoidance of the draft notices was uh, a political choice at the time, or was it, you know, just kind of uh, putting things off and um, trying to avoid it? 
I don't know. Um, so I I could imagine very easily that it was a little bit of both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> that, that there was definitely a political savvy and understanding, right? Because there yeah. was the brewing of an activist. Sure. They went to church every Sunday because my grandmother did, right? When you ask about jobs, the job I think about is my grandmother was the organist of church. That was her okay. job. Yeah. But wait, um, which, which church was it? Do you know? So I don't know which church they went to up there. Yeah. Uh, Presbyterian, um, you know, uh, uh, um, my Aunt Lydia all know, uh, okay. but definitely um, I heard stories about my grandmother taking the kids to Jones Beach, you know, with the church ladies and packing yeah. sandwiches. And then my dad at like three years old cursing and my grandmother being like absolutely mortified and horrified because you can't curse in church, you, can't, you know? Uh, so her kids were like wild in that way. So I have a feeling that there's some activist spirit seed that was already strongly planted in my father. Yeah. Um, and also that he just didn't want to do it, right? Yeah, that he for sure. Yeah. Um, so, because, uh, you know, I hear the stories of my grandmother and grandfather telling my father, get up, you got to get a job, get out, you know, get out of the house, go, go. <laughs> so in the two years in the army, the things that are significant about that experience, besides the, the first people he tried to connect with were the ones from Jackson Avenue. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Where he arrived, he <laughs> the first was the intake. And the woman, you know, name, address, age, height, blah, 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 skin tone. And she looks at him and she looks at him and she says, uh, uh, I'm gonna put olive. And he says, okay, there's two kinds of olives. There's black ones and green ones. Which are you putting? <laughs> quintessential, that's just quintessential poppy, right? Like, yeah. like I'm, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be with you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to connect with you and I'm not going to take this. Right. Yeah. Like, and not, you know, so he was put down as Negro. Uh, of course, Negro yeah. Oh my God. Uh, and he said he had a tough time in the beginning because yeah. he was not wanting to be there. He felt like he'd been kidnapped. And then he used to have to scrub the floors of the barracks with his toothbrush mm -hmm. and was furious. He ended up getting placed in Virginia. And this is, there was no war at this time. I actually do have his documents. I can give you dates at some point. Um, sure. But his real interest, interest ended up being in the ministry. Okay, yeah. And he was really interested. And so he, you know, he ended up working under Colno, who was training him. My father did a lot with the youth ministry at the army base in Virginia yeah. and was beloved, right? Yeah. Um, it was, he lived in the house of the white military officials, right? Yeah. Um, in like a country club. He learned how to play golf. Wow. He said, never shot a gun. He used to have to clean a gun, but he didn't, he didn't know how to shoot a gun yeah. um, because he was interested in the ministry. And he found, and when he left the army and returned, he wanted to come back and join the ministry. Ah, uh, I see, yeah. So he went around trying to join and what he, his experience was that he was told you cannot, you are too dark, you are not welcome here to come uh, in as a as a minister, basically. Yeah. And it's at that point that then he chose to move away from the church and engage with the young lords. Sure, sure. And I think from what I remember, um, did he have some friends in the neighborhood who were uh, some of the earliest young lords as well? Uh, Definitely. Um, yeah. And I'm not sure who all, I don't know the time frame. If you said some names. Um, uh, like Pablo Guzman. Or... Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, so Pablo and Juan. Um, so so um, another thing that happened that's interesting that both Pablo and Juan are, that, that reminds me of that, is that by that time then, um, in 1975, my aunt Lydia and my grandparents moved back to Puerto Rico. Okay, my uncle sure. Mario also moved back to Puerto Rico. Um, and uh, they came back and I'll, I'll get to like what happened in between, but they yeah. ended up coming back and then living with my dad. Everybody who went to Puerto Rico came back and lived in our apartment for a while. Okay, yeah. Um, and I'll talk about that. That was when he lived in Manhattan. But 
it was through Arawak, which is which is uh, one of the organiz like a, a, a community organization. Yeah. That my father ended up finding housing for my grandparents at the towers, right on on a hundred and uh, uh, you know on Fifth Avenue and hundred and ninth, hundred eighth, hundred ninth Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Aurora, uh, uh, Pablo's mother, also like lived right next door, and so they all got. Like those, those are like brand new, you know, like nice, <laughs> like yeah. nice housing project designed with people in mind, like by the people. And so yeah. it was that collection of activists that enabled the parents to get in. Oh, wow. It was actually wow. Felipe Luciano's mother, Aurora. That's who, yeah. But Felipe and Pablo and my dad all like, their moms then all went to church together on 110th Street, right? Yeah. And so they all like, that was a tight group along with the mothers. Okay. Wow. Wow. Oh, that's, that's a really interesting aspect of the story because, you know, I, I, more often than not hear about the relationships among, uh, uh, you know, among the young people who were activists at the time, but um, hearing about the mothers uh, too, that's a very interesting aspect for sure. It's, and it is, it, um, I believe tension fraught, right? These were incredibly religious women, right? Yeah. But, like you got your hair done every Sunday and that was, you just, you dressed your finest to go show up at church. And then you can imagine then to have, to have the group of young lords come to the Spanish Methodist church, right? Like yeah. um, definite tension, but there was still such respect, right? Like going completely different ways, but still, they all came home and like we had, you know, I grew up, I, my whole family gathered there every single Saturday of my whole life until I was 18. We would all go to our little apartment and just eat lunch. You know, yeah. we'd have almoso and Aurora would be over there and they chit chat, you know? Yeah. Um, and so like the tension and the, but this is it, we're family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're stuck with us whether you like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, what, do you know exactly how um, your father first got uh, uh, interested in the Young Lords? Do you know much about um, about that history? I don't, and that's something that I'm so curious about. So I don't know. I'm sure that it was a friend, right? Yeah. Like I, I just knowing my father and the way that he navigated and walked in the world, right? Um, I do know that he, in himself, right, had the um, it's not just that he wanted to be a minister, but that he had a calling. He was incredibly gifted at working with groups of people in community. Sure. Um, he was also right at the time when he was beginning to join, right back from back from the army, um, hired at Lincoln as a community mental health worker. Right. I see. Yeah. So whoever was at Lincoln or in the neighborhood, right at the time. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that I don't have the dates. My aunt Lydia actually might of when he returned from the army, uh, where he was, uh, my grandparents might've still been in the Bronx, but at some point East Harlem became the hub. Okay. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, how long was he at Lincoln before he met your mom? So, um, uh, my mother was there first. Okay, sure. Uh, she was part of the group that des was designing and hiring for the first community, like mental health workers, right? Okay, yeah. And so my mother actually saw my father first through a two way mirror when they were doing group interviews. <laughs> she was on the other side. My father did not see her. That's funny. Uh, oh, so they were still living. They were still living in the Bronx, I know, across the street from Lincoln because. Um, she had seen him in the interview and he, you know, he did, he was like interviewing for this job. Yeah. And uh, like a couple of weeks later, he got an ulcer and he had to be rushed to the hospital mm -hmm. and Lincoln was the hospital. Like that was where they lived and that's where they went. Sure. And so he was admitted, he had a bleeding ulcer. And my mother was, my aunt Lydia said she, she was like assigned, she was in a health administrator, but that she had been assigned to patients to kind of check in on them. Yeah. So, my father still hadn't met my mother, um, yeah. but, and he wasn't yet working at Lincoln. Yeah. My mom was. And so she would like do these rounds of the patients and um, she had already seen him and already like he had caught her eye. 
And so <laughs> my father said, I'm there in the hospital, just, you know, getting better. And then every day there's all these little notes from somebody, you know, <laughs> how are you doing? Just checking in on you. Hope I, right. And my mother was like writing these little notes for him all the yeah. time. And, and so she was like, wow, I really do know just that he ended up getting admitted and leaving these notes. But my father's side of the story was that he didn't really know, but he <laughs> saw this woman and he's like, wow, she has such nice legs. <laughs> <laughs> Lying in the hospital bed, watching this woman walk back and forth and back and forth. <laughs> and so then he was hired, right, as sure. one of the outreach team. And so he, he started working at Lincoln. Like they met right at the beginning. She hired him, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And I think at this point, maybe um, it makes sense to to hear about uh, your mom's family history since, you know, we're at the point where their lives are inter intersecting. Um, so, so yeah, does that sound good to you? We'll backtrack and, and hear about your mom's family history now? Yes, yes. And I, I have a document that I wish I had in front of me that could give me some more details. So if you'll forgive me for not having it, but we oh, can sure. circle back with some dates and times. Yes. Sure. Uh, so my mother um, was born and raised in Brooklyn, um, in Far Rockaway, uh, and yeah. she is the daughter of Sophie Sutton and Paul Kroll. Mm. And Paul and Sophie, um, it's their parents who came over from Minsk and Pinsk, which is uh, Russia, or you know, like depending on um, uh, Poland, Russia, depending on the borders. Yeah, yeah. Um, their families, both Eastern European Jews, they came actually to New Jersey first and then New York um, during one of the pogroms. So not during World War II, but sure. before. Him. Sure. And my grandfather, Paul's father was a rabbi. And um, my grandmother, Sophie, um, her uncle actually was a blacksmith and then came and established a blacksmithery or whatever you call it wow. a smith in new jersey and so they were like native brooklynites who were striving to fit in yeah and so they pretty much did nothing that related to judaism right Basically. they didn't celebrate any holidays they did my my grandfather obviously not just growing up with a rabbi but they spoke hebrew at home yeah my, there was not a word of hebrew or yiddish yeah spoken in the house it was all english and we want to assimilate we want to just fit in sure. um so they celebrated nothing my um my grandmother sophie had these had uh two aunts so they were three sisters all together um one of them uh you know they were also all in new york but one of them actually eventually went back to israel mm. um and so my mother has a cousin who we call aunt lucy who was born in israel and um, another one of Sophie's sisters used to have satyrs uh, once in a while. And so my mom might go there, but Paul and Sophie were really, uh, they might go as family visitors, but it wasn't something that they were holding in yeah. the life of my mother or my aunt. Yeah. Um, my grandmother was an artist. Um, here, am I allowed to move the computer for a second? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. of course. <laughs> so this is... Um, Oh, wow. This is my grandmother, Sophie, and this is my mom's, and the rest of these are actually my daughters. <laughs> wow, that's, that's really cool, and the yeah. generational, generational yeah. art here. <laughs> yeah, and she was um, uh, an artist and a writer, but, you know, at that time, it's not like she could do that as a career, and she actually used to have a pen name of Paul Kroll, because she, she, she didn't believe that as a woman she could do that. Sure. Uh, my my aunt Susan is two and a half years older than my mother, and um, they uh, uh, both went to Erasmus Hall High School. Mm, yeah. And my mom actually, <laughs> one of my mom's classmates was Barbara Streisand, and she always <laughs> told me about that. And one thing Barbara ever wanted was a daughter, and my mom said, "That's the one thing I have that Barbara doesn't. <laughs> That's a daughter." <laughs> um, my mom, my grandfather um, was a mathematician and mm -hmm. incredibly uh, skillful in that in that area. And he stayed employed throughout the whole Great Depression. Wow. Uh, he was a math teacher at Columbia. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, there was sort of art and math 
um, and literature. And my mom, who had friction with her mom, uh, yeah. was eager to make her way in the world and graduated from Erasmus early, got into Barnard, mm. and started attending Barnard at age 16. Wow. And graduated Phi Beta Kappa. And I grew up in the apartment in the building that she had when she was at Barnard. And so she left home early and had an incredible head on her shoulders and a really serious feminist streak, right? Yeah, yeah. Part of the tension with my grandmother was, <laughs> you gotta be a full person. And my, my aunt, her older sister, got married at age maybe 19. And my mom didn't, see, like, she didn't wanna just become someone's wife, which was sure. the mom that she had. She was very, very clear about that. Um, but it was a very white, Jewish, far Rockaway upbringing. Yeah. Um, but my mother's interest, she actually got her, her uh, undergraduate in art history, but there was a thread, right? This is like when you ask about my father, there was something about public health, right? Mm -hmm. And that was her life's work, public yeah. health, particularly public health administration. Sure. And so she found her way from, you know, the apartment was on 105th and West End. So she had graduated from Barnard and found her way up to Lincoln Hospital. And I'm still figuring out what the whole set of roles were. She was there for a number of years and I'm trying to figure, I'm trying to get some dates here, but I know uh, it might even be in her thesis. So I'll look that up to see how long she was there. Yeah. She ended up um, as, uh, you know, she was an administrator, she was not a doctor, right? But moving from sort of baseline into much higher levels. Um, and that time there definitely shaped her, her outlook on life. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Um, and so as far as your, your mom's uh, upbringing goes, um, in I guess any of the places that she lived until, um, until she got to Lincoln Hospital, um, were most of the places that she lived uh, primarily um, different white communities or, yeah? Yeah, as far as I know. And one of the um, things that my grandfather did for income was, uh, so they owned their homes um, sure. and they, uh, he would buy a pretty rundown home and then fix it up and then sell it and move. And so she grew up moving a lot. Right. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. We're all within kind of like the far Rockaway community. Uh, yeah. Coney Island was a big home. Like she, uh, in my life, she used to take me to Coney Island a lot in the summer because that's where she grew up, right? Like, yeah. like riding the cyclone, that was her thing, right? That was just <laughs> growing up and high school and adventure and all, all, all the things that were. Um, so a very, uh, and all the pictures of her friends were also, you know, like these 1950s kind of white images. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yep, Jewish. I'm sure most people are Jewish. Oh, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so when she when she met your father and they they got together and and started dating and all, um, uh, do you know if there was any uh, friction with her family over that? Yeah. Yeah. So th their families had very different reactions. So these three aunts, uh, I mean my my grandmother and then the you know so they were three sisters. Um, so. Um, my understanding is that my mom's father, my grandfather, with whom she was actually quite close, uh, embraced my father day one and always did. Yeah. Just period. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not as clear about my grandmother, but I do know that her sisters had very, very different reactions. Nice. Uh, one of them just adored my dad um, yeah. and uh, invited him to his first Seder and you know, they left the door open to let Elijah in and a homeless man came to the door. And my father, of course, handled it really gracefully, right? Like yeah. my dad, and she always remembered that. And he remembered that Seder. <laughs> Other aunt, um, to this day, you know, uh, uh, my mom had blood type O positive. Mm -hmm. My dad had blood type A negative. My brother and I both have A negative. And she would talk about now the negative blood that has entered the family, right? Literally, yeah. the blood type, but that we've been tainted. Yeah. Right? Um, and that was 
just super clear. So within my mom's family, there was a real split of, and I know about my grandfather's loving, warm embrace of my father. Sure. That I don't know as much about my grandmother's leaves me with that question mark of, yeah. um, I certainly haven't heard of a complete rejection, but, and then my aunt Susan, um, uh, married somebody who uh, outwardly uh, would no longer allow my my aunt and my mom to talk to each other. Wow. Uh, now there's this black guy in the family. Wow. And so they used to have to like, they call each other, you know, my, my aunt would have to like sneak into the bathroom to talk on the phone. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, my brother and I, so I, I obviously, I have light skin. Uh, my brother has darker skin. He looks much more Latino, right? Yeah. When I was little, I mean, I always had this hair, but it was blonde. And mm. so that uncle um, saw me as the Jewish one and my brother's the Latino one. And he thought I was the smart one and my brother was the athletic one. And I was the one who was worth talking to and my brother was not. And so there's a thread that, that, that still continues. Now that's yeah. softened. Um, and after my mother's passing, my, my aunt on that side was like, I don't care. Like, mm-mm. <laughs> like, yeah. These are these are my ne my niece and nephew, and that's just the way it is. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But uh, um, it was a it ruffled it ruffled a lot of yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, especially since uh, you know you already spoke about uh, in your mother's family, so many of them you know wanting to fit in and even kind of not yes. having anything to do with um, Judaism. I mean, it's kind of uh, uh, to become white, you have to get rid of, uh, uh, you know, every every kind of uh, particular aspect of your national and cultural identity. Um, yeah, and to, to it's, you know, it's no wonder, Stephen, that, uh, you know, that I, I wrote this thesis and that the first, you know, chapters are all about assimilation, right? Yeah. The push, the pull, the tug, the draw, and what assimilation has looked like for different communities, right? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I, I, have, I have those models, right? Yeah. Now, at the same time, on the other side of my family, my mom was like welcomed with huge open arms. Yeah. Here's the thing, right? So all of my aunts and uncles on my, you know, particularly my Aunt Lydia and Uncle Mario, they like love my mom from day one and still, you know, until the day she died and still now, right? Just, yeah. and, and I have a lot of stories about because my Aunt Lydia worked across the street from Lincoln at the JC Penney accounting office. Ah. I used to get little tickets from Lincoln Cafeteria that have lunch together. I mean, just yeah. amazing. Like that's the family I grew up with. But my grandmother, so my grandmother, my father's mother, um, uh, you know, had this dark mother. Yeah. But also Rafael, who was a Spanish shoulder, because somewhere in there, somebody got green eyes. My father had green eyes. Yeah. My aunt had green eyes. Both of them had the darkest skin, but the light eyes. I come out like this. <laughs> and, and one of the things was that my grandmother was just so great. Que bueno que tenemos una judía, right? <laughs> Thank God. There's somebody Jewish in the family, and she's white. And then look, look at la nena, right? I was always called la gringa, right? Yeah. Like, oh, good. You're, you... Right, it's the opposite of what my mom's family was saying. Yeah, we're we're moving up in the world because look how fair skinned. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, I don't know. There's some good metaphor. Maybe you know it, but you know, it spins both ways. Oh yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. However, it it's um, what did happen was that. Um, my mom was immediately embraced, like every family celebration. And one of the things that happened was that the, the, there wasn't really tension about being Jewish or Christian, right? Yeah. My mom was delighted to celebrate Christmas. <laughs> 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 and had celebrated it more emphatically than my father. Yeah. Um, but she also lit Hanukkah candles for us. Ah, uh, sure. And she also chose to send my brother and I to a Jewish sleepaway camp. Uh. because. Parts of our identity that she didn't have the ability to teach us, yeah. that we didn't have the community to learn about, yeah. but that felt really important for her that we were aware of. Sure. And so for seven and eight weeks every summer, starting at age six, we would go to this camp, right? Wow. 
and it was a huge, you know, she wanted to get us out of the city too, et cetera. And so there still was that thread, but so there was, there, there was an interesting piece. And, and what I'm laying here is the foundation to make some sense. I think it'll, it'll help make sense of how my family kind of continued on in their unique way uh, yeah. as, as we all grew, but as their relationship matured. Yeah. So there's something about her arrival at Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx with the obvious, there was tension with her family, right? There's ways that she was veering away from them anyway that the conditions were set for that group to become like family. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know, I don't know, like, I, I, th I said this to you before, but I wanna say this again, that whenever I've talked to anybody about Lincoln days, literally their whole countenance changes. Wow. And they get this look, right? There's like, it's more than family. I just met somebody who knew my parents and worked with them. And he's like, you know, your family. I was like, yeah, yeah, right. There's something about the conditions there and the people who chose to show up and what the, the choices that they had to make. And there's something about the, that, that ground that enabled my parents to form their relationship in a yeah. very, you know, um, uh fiery time <laughs> yeah 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 i i forget exactly what he said this so this is paraphrasing but gil fagiani either he wrote it or said it i forget which but um but i remember his words something along the lines of uh there were years at lincoln hospital where it's the closest that we've come in the u.s to a new society um yeah. something like that <laughs> uh which is which is wild to think of i mean but um, some of the programs and some of the things they developed at Lincoln Hospital, I mean, you know, no place, you know, no place now is even, um, as, or at least few places now are even thinking of some of these questions that, that people were raising at the time. So, so right. yeah. Something, yeah. This, something, something. And, and the, the fact that, so my parents obviously had some, you know, there was a magnetism there. Yeah. And there was only taboo like an ad hierarchically an administrator and a community health worker yeah. Basically, the guy who lives in the bronx who's black looks black right and then the white jewish woman from barnard from the upper west side yeah <laughs> programmatically right like the programs that they sat in everything was um was not possible <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll have to say it. How's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's 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 uh, that's very well put. I think. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess your your parents had already met by the time your father uh, started getting involved in in the young lords. Then, huh? Yeah. So this is where I my my dates and details are fuzzy, but I am sure that he was. Um, if not an active member of the Lords, he was at, he, what I know is when he arrived back from the army and got rejected from the church. Yeah. It was so clear. And there was a lot of uh, ample opportunity around yeah. to start figuring out how to engage politically. Right. Yeah. And so his attention, um, so for from from my lifespan, my father was not engaged in the church. He was completely like a, a a radical activist and an educator. Sure. Um, up to the moment when my mom got sick and then he returned, right? But yeah. all of his energy from the point of returning from the army on uh, was was in some kind of activism. So the time of engaging with the Lords, was he, you know, part, you know, he wasn't part of the central committee. Sure. Um, however, my uncle Mario said something really interesting to me. He said, you know, Aviva, you're not going to have evidence and you're not going to, but I'm going to tell you that the work that your father, you know, he said your father was uh, always like to be a number two, which I yeah. know about my father, right? Yeah. That's what he was. Well, he was Victor Alisea's right hand, right? Yeah. The role my father played brilliantly. Um, and he said, your father was starting things at Lincoln and coming up with, right? Like the, those outreach, the, the TB and the lead poisoning, the breakfasts, yeah. And coach drives, he said, your father, like never once, he's not getting up with a microphone on the TV and it up, but he said, your father was like the genesis 
of so much of that. And yeah. he never would take a step of credit or anything. So there's something about, now, I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's my uncle's perspective. I don't know. Um, what I'm not clear on is the Lords and Lincoln Hospital timing, right? Of yeah. when the community health programs were really, I know my father was right on the ground floor of that which ones of the lords were there pulling right which were pulling from the community into lincoln there's like flow maybe you know <laughs> well so i have heard actually cleo silvers um who first is the first person who told me about your father she told me your father was the main person that was connecting um the lords and the health revolutionary unity movement which was at lincoln and yep. think Lincoln, um, uh, which was mostly, I think, some of the white doctors and uh, uh, health professionals. But she told me your father was kind of at the very center of connecting all of these different groups together. Um, okay, so yeah. that's, my Uncle Mario said the same thing. And one of the things that Mario said, which you're helping me put in context, um, uh, and it's so like, that was my dad's beauty. Like you've just described his, his gifts in the world, um, was that, my father had the ability um this is this is how this is how i understand his beginning days at lincoln to walk with the mother who walked in from the community whose child is sick who doesn't speak english who's really scared who needs to navigate through who thinks her kids being taken she doesn't even know where right and he would sit with her whatever it was in the ER and the thing and the operator, you know, right? And be there. And at the same time, he would go to the doctors and have the ability to talk to the, so the, the, I, I hear the words administrator, paraprofessional and professional, right? The hierarchy, the language of Lincoln, there's something in that hierarchy that I hear reinforced in almost every story, right? Yeah. My father was at the bottom of that hierarchy yeah. and managed, to not just communicate with, but build really deep relationships yeah. with them, right? And my mother also was moving along that hierarchical, right? But my father, like his one foot in the community, whatever, you know, from the gang to the gay robins to the lords, right? Yeah. Always like right there, grounded there. <laughs> yeah. um, but the ability, right, to like navigate through the system. And I am sure, he sat in the emergency room with the mother and then somehow took some of that information up to the doctors and back yeah. down, right? Yeah. So my understanding, like I think of my father and said to her because he's the storyteller. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And what my Uncle Mario is saying actually makes sense, right? That he had one foot solidly grounded in both places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and, you know, I don't know if, if it was just um, uh, particular to how things were set up at Lincoln or the people like your father who worked there at the time, but it's hard for me to imagine that kind of um, uh, connection taking place in, in most hospitals uh, uh, today at all. <laughs> um, I mean, who's, who's going to make the connections? I, I, I don't even, I don't even know anymore, but. Um, right. And that's, so these, these, Operating plan, the PC, what is it, OPC, the um, oh, uh, organization. organizational planning committee meetings yeah. where I see Dr. Peck, Dr. 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 and Daniel Argote. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, huh, right? Like, what? What? And, and just, I'm going to skip ahead a lot of years just because yeah, sure. it's so relevant that, mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, uh, Mike Smith was, you heard about Mike? Yeah. Uh, right. Acupuncturist, doctor, sure. um, big in the sort of acupuncture movement for, you know, working with uh, addiction, et cetera. Um, when Mike got divorced, right. So Mike Schmidt, like he's, you know, one of the white coats. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, he came and lived with, so my parents had gotten divorced by this time okay, and, he sure. came and lived at our apartment, my dad's apartment because he wanted to learn how to be a father. Wow. No, any other way except to come and actually watch my father parent us. Yeah. My dad opened the door to his apartment. You know, it's not like we had a big apartment. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and 
Mike and his two girls lived right down the hall in what later became my bedroom, right? And my yeah. brother and I and my dad, right? Like that yeah. was, and that level of like a wholeness, right? That that I might be a doctor leading this movement and I'm, you know, like on the headlines and I'm and I need to learn how to be a parent. Could you help me? Right? Yeah. What? What yeah. can you imagine this? That's oh, crazy. <laughs> no, exactly. Can you imagine anybody from Bellevue or Lincoln? I have like today. I have no, you know. No, right? no, I can't. No, it's impossible for me to imagine that. Um, yeah. I, wow. Yeah. So there was what I, um, uh, H- Harold Kuden, who I recently just remet, obviously who knew me and knew my parents, was saying, "Aviva." I worked with so many people at Lincoln for so many years, but your parents really stand out in my memory, right? And so there was something about the way that they both, you know, here I have the hierarchy here in front of me. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. The way my imagining is that my mother actually moved linearly, right? Yeah. Used the written word, right? to navigate the system and that my father would move yeah. like this between the community out and back in, right? Yeah. And his relational acumen, right? Yeah. And so together, they like if you put that together, that's like a nice weaving, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and so there's a way that they managed, right? And that happened both outside with the young lords and with they were what they were planning and doing and then inside within Lincoln. Yeah. So, so what are some of the specific stories you remember hearing about? Um, maybe we'll just take them in the order you said about your parents helping with planning actions with the young lords, and then helping with planning things at at Lincoln. Um, particular stories that you remember hearing. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, so um, that that the, this picture to me is like the um, look how it, it totally. This, this one just speaks, I actually have it on digital so I can share it with you, but the one of my mom and my dad in the, um, in front of the young Lord's office, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. My father standing there, you know, with his, like this at the entrance of the office. And my mom is walking by in a poncho that she, she always used to knit and crochet, right? In the like total 1970s <laughs> poncho. <laughs> I'm sure it's bright and colored as a black and white photograph. Um, and there she is on 110th, probably between Lexington and third, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? Um, so what I understand is that at, well, first their relationship was completely not public, right? Because it yeah. would have been um, taboo for all the reasons that we've talked about. Sure. And so only a, a very few people at Lincoln knew that they were in relationship. But my father ended up moving in with her on the Upper West Side. Mm. So her home, was a really safe, off off of the charts. Nobody was watching her house on 105th and West End Avenue, right? Yeah. yeah. So her home was a place where a number of the planning meetings of the young lords would happen because it yeah. was totally safe and off the map. And I know you said that there's other other places like the unsuspecting homes or apartments that have yeah. been used. For sure, for sure. A priest apartment that I've heard of. Yeah. Uh, right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. A priest apartment. Right. Right. Um, and, uh, uh, their friend, colleague, Bruce Miller, who's my godfather talked about, he also had a car. And so he used to lend them his car, right. Whenever the Lord needed something, right. Yeah. Like so there's these sort of white Jewish or white allies who yeah. were on the periphery with a little bit more privilege, right. Yeah. Practicing their privilege by my mom's case, opening the door to her apartment. So yeah. I've heard that they did a number of the planning meetings and, you know, it was a, a studio, right. Yeah. Like. <laughs> it wasn't particularly big, right? But yeah. that, that's okay, right? But that's part of where they gathered. Um, and the the thing that so when the young lords started to fracture, right? Two of the threads that really caused the biggest wedges were around the 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 treatment of women, right? Yeah. And the chauvinism and the feminist threat and the women's committee. Sure. And the militant violence, right? There's also the, you know, que viva Puerto Rico Libre and Puerto Rican yeah. independence, right? Those yep. are sort of the three. But two of those three were really significant in my parents' relationship, right? Sure. So my, my mother, as I've already described, was uh, uh, 
uh, her own person from the time she was five, right? Yeah. She and the feminist movement was really in her her being and her blood and her body, right? Yeah. And so I am certain that within their relationship, right, the the my mother's perspective on the role of women yeah. would have influenced my father's perspective on what it could possibly be within the Lords, right? Sure. And while my father grew up in a pretty traditional, you know, at least Latino home, right? The yeah. Puerto Rican and Cuban mix, there were some real like uh, built in cultural norms that he grew yeah. up with, right? Some might call them, you know, machismo or chauvinism, you know, whatever it is. Sure. Uh, my mother didn't. So they managed through that to create their own relationship. And so yeah. I'm certain that my mom had opinions about how the women within the Lords, right, were acting, what kind of voice they had in my father's role. And my mother was never like, she might have hosted the planning meeting, but she wasn't in a lot of the actions, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and the other was around the militant piece. And they, my, my father, what I understand, used to then have sort of side meetings at the Lincoln Hospital cafeteria. Uh, in particular, I've heard this story from Robert Pope, um, mm -hmm. who a long-term friend. Have you heard his name? I, I, you mentioned him to me. Yeah. yeah. So he was born black, born and raised in Pasadena, right? But ended up at Lincoln. Cause I, you know, I don't know how all these people ended up at Lincoln, but he ended up at Lincoln too. <laughs> um, and Robert and my dad, so, you know, the, 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 that distinct way that, that the Puerto Rican black alliance that is, right? Yeah. I didn't understand that was distinct until I myself went to school in California and realized, oh, the, the Mexicans and the Blacks, they see each other as different. I didn't know yeah. that. I, yeah. I think about Puerto Rico, I don't know, it's just sort of the same thing. Um, like it's yeah. just such a, so my dad and Robert were starting to have a whole set of other conversations that I'm sure that my mom was foundational in about, well, we're not actually, we don't want to follow. There's got to be another way than just to pick up the guns like the Panthers. Yeah. I'm sure there's another way, but how do we find it? How can we, right? So there was like a strategic conversation happening. Sure. What could we do as the thrust is going there, right? Like how do we direct the anger? How do we continue to focus on the actions instead of on the militancy, right? Sure. And so that's the thread that my parents were holding together, right? Like I heard, I've heard more, you know, my mom died when I was much younger, so I've had less, you know, she died when I was 18, so I've had so much less time to hear her stories. Um, so my father's stories are more of the ones that, I've, that I was privileged enough to have. But that dialogue was really important, and I'm sure that, that, that their connection and relationship, right, yeah. um, helped to fuel that, right? The question of, it, it can't just be either or. Either we pick up guns or we break. There's got to be a reconciling force, yeah. uh, which, of course, was my parents' practice. That's how they lived in the world. That's what their relationship was, right? We're not gonna, right? Yeah. So there's something about the very essence of how they came together and their, I don't know where it came from, shared belief that you don't have to fit within the cultural norm that you're given <laughs> that fueled a lot of my father's role within the Lords. Sure, sure. Um, and, do you remember, uh, do you remember much over the years um, when you were growing up, uh, did your were your parents very close with um, former lords or, you know, former people from Jackson Avenue or what are some of the people that you remember? Um, Lincoln as well, some of the people that were your parents' closest friends from that time. So, yes, and I'll, I'll start and then, um, this is probably where we'll end our today, but I, so my, <laughs> honestly, my like main memory. So um, my dad lived on 108th between Broadway and Amsterdam. And my main memory of my whole life is every time we'd walk out on the street, anything to go to the grocery store, the dry cleaner, the ice cream shop, to walk to the park, to go to the bus, my father would run into at least two people <laughs> every day. Like I'm talking every, every single time. Yeah. And usually it's more than two. And always at least one of them was, oh, that's an old friend from Lincoln. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's an old friend from the neighborhood. Right? Yeah. Like literally every time we walk outside. Yeah. <laughs> By the time we went down in 10th Street, that was it. Right? Like <laughs> uh, 
and I'm, I'm only, I'm barely exaggerating. Like I really, literally, this is yeah. my dad. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so the stories that I got often happen walking from 108 to like 112 to the, to the grocery store and back, right? Yeah. Because that's when we would meet somebody. Um, so the, within those little sort of spheres, uh, we seem to run into Lincoln people on the street. Yeah. Um, and we seem to run into the young lords, more of them went to my grandmother's house, right? And so we were all in El Barrio. Um, and went so sort of like east side, west side, that's kind of like the divide that I was getting, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he was always on the phone, right? Like he was always on the phone connecting with someone. And then the third circle really was a Boricua, right? Sure, so sure. to me, I mean, I grew up a Boricua, like literally, we go there during vacations and just hang out at the at, on campus. Yeah. Um, but the people, so in my in my thesis, when I wrote, most of the interviews that my father connected me with were people like Abe Cruz, people who weren't. A, a couple of them were active Lord members, but they were all active in Boricua, right? Sure. So my my father, you know, from Lincoln to the Lords to Boricua, and then back to church. Those yeah. were sort of like the circles of people. And then also in the neighborhood and he played tennis and all that stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. Those four groups are the ones that were most active and alive with regard to my dad. Sure. From my mom's side, um, there is a small core group um, and they all, um, the ones who I knew most were all white um, in that core circle, including two of my godfathers, um, who, uh, I were incredibly active in her. She very actively maintained all those relationships. Yeah. Um, and after she died, those were the people who I would go to most frequently just to literally say, can you tell me a story about my mom? I just yeah. want to know who she was, right? Sure. And they're all Lincoln connections. So yeah. all the like stories besides my, my aunt, my grandparents on my mom's side all came from her Lincoln days. Oh, and yeah. so um, and they also knew my dad. And so I, because I was keeping those relationships alive, just because I needed to know who my mom was, they also were super active with my dad, you know? Yeah. You um, may not have had as much contact with them. So I'm making five circles. My dad's Lincoln, the, the young Lord's folks, you know, the people from church who inevitably overlap with the Lord's, the Bronx and El Barrio, yeah. and then the Bronx folks, and then my mom's little Lincoln crew that are connected. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Are you following my fingers? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that's a good place to stop uh, uh, for today. And we can pick up on more Lincoln stories next time and Boricua and, um, you know, e everything going going forward. Uh, um, I'm sure I'm sure with the Lincoln stories alone, there'll be enough to fill a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, this is, yeah, I just, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm so I'm so grateful and appreciative, really, for for the work that you're doing to keep these stories alive. It's super meaningful, uh, not just to me, but I know there's a whole bunch of us out there. Um, so I just I know we're going to continue, but I just want to end this one with a, a really big and sincere gratitude. Well, it's really, really my my pleasure and and privilege. I mean, I get to talk to so many wonderful people and hear so many amazing stories. So, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now.